Yeah. Okay. Then, I got it. I got it. Okay. You can it. just hit the yeah. start. <laughs> All right. I mean, I feel like I'm going to kind of start like this anyway. They kind of snuck in. Okay, like, yeah, hey, boys well. and girls. All right. Here we go. Yep. yep. And it'll say live when we're live. It'll turn red. Hey, boys and girls. It's Mr. Muscleman, and welcome to a very festive Holiday Wild Wednesday. I'm so glad to be here with you today. We're going to be talking all about the special holiday favor investigation tool that Miss P and I gave to you. If you are an in-person student, you should have received this baggie and this special tool in your class this week. If you're a remote academy student, you're able to pick this up at the Burlington Public Library if you have not already done so. Our special tool is none other than the amazingly wonderful eyedropper. We're going to be performing some eyedropper science with you today in hopes that you will investigate with this special tool at home over the holidays. To access any of the directions and investigation information that you'll want to, uh, that will help you investigate along the way, just scan this QR code with your iPad device or other device, and you'll be able to access the presentation that Ms. P and I have put together for you to walk through those investigations. It's going to be a great time with whoever it is that you're sharing your holiday with. Now, eyedroppers are super cool tools that are used in lots of biological and medical professions. They're helpful in that they allow people to use small amounts of liquid, right? A liquid is, of course, one of the three forms of matter, along with solid and gas. Liquids can change, uh, stay the same volume, but will take on the shape of whatever container they're in. That, of course, includes liquids like this water. Now, to start us off with our first investigation, I'm going to have none other than the wonderful Miss P join me with her very festive Blair, come on over, Miss P. Miss P, I said festive Blair. I'm festive, festive for our first science investigation. Our first science investigation, boys and girls, is called the Cartesian Diver. And I feel like I'm appropriately festive for that type of experiment. All right. Wow. I wonder, what is the Cartesian Diver? Well, the Cartesian Diver is a two liter soda or other drink bottle. And you're going to see inside is our eyedropper. And we have that liquid water inside. And what's really, really neat about the Cartesian Diver is you can make the diver sink or float by putting a little squeeze or pressure <laughs> on the bottle. That's amazing, Miss P. It's amazing. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to do this and exactly how it works. That's for you to investigate with our science slideshow with that QR code. But one of the things I do want to talk to you about is how the science behind this diver is similar to how the science of real scuba diving works. And I am a biologist. I actually wanted to be a marine biologist. And I got certified to scuba dive when I was 16 years old. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how the science of diving works. Now, when you dive, you go into the water, correct? We go into the water. And when you go into the water, what direction do we go? 
down. Very good. Now, I want you to think about something like our water. And I have this cup of water here. This cup of water has mass to it, or it feels heavy, versus a cup that might only have air in it. So our water has more mass or is heavier than the air. So when you actually go diving and you go into that water, which has more mass, there is a lot of force or pressure pressing on your body. And all divers have some tools, just like our eyedropper is a tool. And this is what's called a gauge, and there's many of them here. The bottom gauge is a compass, and that's so you know what direction you're in, because sometimes you can't see where you're going underwater. The visibility, or it might be cloudy, is very poor. Then the next thing here, read in PSI, is our pressure. And we're not really measuring the pressure of the water, so to say, but in the back of our scuba gear, I would have a tank that's filled with air. And we want to make sure that we have enough air that's going into our lungs to breathe underwater. Because I don't know about you, I can't breathe underwater. Can you guys? No, nope. we wish we could. Now, this special tool is called a regulator. You'll see it has a mouthpiece, and you stick it into your mouth, and the hose connects to that tank with the air. So that allows me to breathe. Now, the other gauge here is our depth. And depth is very important because as you go further down in this water, there is more force or more pressure on your body. And how many of you have gone swimming and maybe you go down to the bottom of that pool? Yeah. Have you ever noticed when you go down, it kind of feels like it's squeezing you a little bit? Or you might have to squeeze your nose because air in your ears feels a little funny and, and it kind of feels like pressure or force is happening inside those ears. Yeah. So we have to make sure that we're following all of these little tools and gauges when we go down. Now, just like um, when we have air on the surface and in my tank, we also have to have air in this vest. And this is called a BC, a buoyancy control device. And buoyancy is another word for float, just like our diver is floating or buoyant in our bottle. Now, um, this control device here, this BC, you can add air into it by either pressing this button and it comes from the tank and it blows up your vest, or you can do it manually by using your mouth and blowing into that vest. And what it does is if I'm floating in the water and I have this pressure and I want to go down and sink or I want to go back up to the top while I'm scuba diving, I can either add or release that air to help me to do so. Or I can wear a belt with some weights. But it's important to always keep an eye on that pressure or that force that's going on your body. And just like with diving, that pressure or that force affects what's going on with the air and the diver. So, um, and besides that, there are other neat tools like flippers and our mask. And of course, I'm wearing a snorkel, which could be used if you're at the surface. But diving is an exciting thing that happens and it's a really neat way to investigate our Cartesian diver. Miss P, that's so awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to hear what you think about this little diver that you're going to create at home. Remember that the instructions for how to set up your Cartesian diver demonstration will be found on your presentation that you can uh, access by scanning that code. And there you can make some connections between what's happening here and what might happen in the real world. With this investigation and all of the investigations that we'll be sharing, we hope that you will let us know what you're thinking, what you've figured out, and what you've learned by either se by sending us an, an email, either Ms. Pavlicek or me, Mr. Musselman. Now that moves us on to our second investigation, right, Ms. P? Mr. Musselman, no. penny for your thoughts? Why not? So Ms. P, um, 
we're going to explore the properties of matter and how they interact with one another. So I'm going to bring our attention on over here. Awesome. Hmm? I, think, I think we just jumped. <laughs> So we're going to just set up a little demonstration. One of the wonderful ways that we can explore with our eyedropper is to use the eyedropper in a little tool that we call some eyedropper science. You got me? Yeah. Did we skip parts here? Yeah. yeah. Right. So what we want to do here is we're going to set up a second investigation where we're going to explore the property of water. Right, Miss P? Right. <laughs> and we're going to explore a really special feature that Miss P is going to share about in the in the liquid world. Miss P? Awesome. Now, water itself is very important for all life. It's critical. Not only is it important for living things like organisms, but our bodies are made out of 60% of water. Our earth is covered by 70% of water, and it even helps regulate the temperature on our, the surface of our earth. So what's really neat is that there are certain organisms that use the special properties of water that to do certain things every day. Now, when we look at water, water is made of particles. Have you ever heard of the term H2O? There are two hydrogen particles and one oxygen particle. And these particles actually attract and combine with each other. They're very sticky. Water has a very sticky property. And when they do this, they make a special force that we call surface Tension. Can you guys say that? Good. Surface tension. Now, those organisms use this surface tension to their advantage. And one is called a water strider. Here's the picture of the water strider insect. Up close. Up close. <laughs> what do you notice? You might notice that they have really, really long, flexible legs. And not only are their legs touching the water, but so are their antenna. But you'll notice the body is not touching the water. And that sticky property of the water particles allows the striders to glide and move on top of the water using surface tension. Thanks, Miss P. Surface tension plays a big role in our next investigation. I like to call this investigation the penny investigation but you're probably going to investigate all sorts of different kinds of loose change at your home. The question I'm asking you as a scientist is to make a prediction about how many water drops can fit on the head of a penny. Now eyedroppers are a great tool for this because eyedroppers can slowly and carefully allow us to drop small amounts of liquid onto a surface or into a mixture. And what I'll want you to do is first make a prediction. A prediction, of course, is not a wild guess, but an educated one, one that you think about before sharing and maybe have a reason or two around why you're guessing the way that you are or I should say predicting. Now, when I make a prediction about how many drops of water might fit on this coin, I might think about what do I know about the size of drops of water? Maybe I might test a few drops first with my eyedropper before starting to add. I should probably think about the size of the coin itself and how many drops I think might fit onto it. Whether you pick or predict two drops, 20 drops, or 200 drops, 
I want you to record your prediction in a data table. A data table like the one that we've shared with you in our presentation or one that you come up with on your own. Whatever your data table looks like, it should include the name or a picture of the coin and your prediction of how many drops and then the actual number, right? So here we go. Just kidding. I'm not doing this investigation for you. That would take away all the fun. So I want you to do this investigation yourself, but I don't want you to stop at your, uh, with your penny, right? I want you to use what you learn from your penny investigation to then improve your predictions for the other coins that you might test. For example, if you determined that maybe 10 drops of water fit on this penny's front or what we call its face, how many drops would you expect to find on a smaller coin? Or how many drops would you expect to fit on a larger coin? There are other questions that you can investigate here too, like do you always get the same number of drops on your penny? You might have a chance to test that out or test different ways to drop that, those droplets on that penny. Are you dropping from high up or are you dropping from very close as is recommended by eyedropper users everywhere? Whatever you learn, again, we want you to chart on your data table and share with us. Now, liquids like water are not the only type of uh, liquid that we can test in our eyedroppers or use in our investigations. And that brings us to our third and final investigation that we're going to be talking about today. It's a flashback to our Halloween presentation of pumpkin science. <clears throat> and that's, of course, what happens when two or more kinds of matter interact or come together. How do they change? What do we notice and what do we observe? Miss P, do you mind bringing over my, sure. my special materials? Right. Thanks, Miss P. Now, during pumpkin science, you probably remember pumpkin puke when we launched all sorts of crazy foam out of our pumpkin. We will not be performing a pumpkin science investigation at home. Instead, I've challenged you with some basic materials that you can find at home, such as uh, vegetable oil and water, baking soda and vinegar. These are all interactions or that where we bring two different kinds of matter together. Sometimes new matter is made, sometimes it's not. What I want you to do is observe, record what you notice, and make sense of what you're seeing for yourself. Record those surprising findings that you notice. To give you an example of how I might do that, I'm going to mix some of the pumpkin puke materials again right here at the Science Center. Now to do that, I'm going to need a Petri dish. Whoops. I'm going to need my eyedropper. I'm not going to need my <coughs> coins. Right? Uh, Miss P, I do need some eye protection. Would you mind bringing me over some eye protection? <laughs> Either in the form of those safety glasses or your scuba gear. Here we go. And to help a little bit with this presentation, I'm going to actually use a different color piece of paper so that you can see what's on our Petri dish. Now, in the pumpkin puke experiment, we used a mysterious powder. a powder that is actually called potassium iodide. And then we used a mysterious liquid that looked a lot like water, but is actually not. It does not have the same properties. It's not made of the same 
chemicals that water is made of. So it has different interactions or reactions with this powder. Now in pumpkin puke, you probably noticed that <clears throat> we had a sudden release of gas in the form of bubbles that came flying out of the pumpkin puke. In our investigation today, I'm taking out the soap bubbles and just using that special liquid, right? A liquid known as hydrogen peroxide, right? That hydrogen peroxide, I'm going to slowly add to the potassium iodide to see what happens. What do you think is going to happen, knowing what you know about pumpkin puke from our October show? Now, when I mix any type of matter, it's important, and, I'm, and I don't know what's going to happen, it's important that I do use some way to protect my eyes. I'm going to slowly add this hydrogen peroxide matter to our powder, and we're going to see what happens right now. Here we go. Woo! What did you just notice? What did you observe? Shall we check it out again? Let's take a look. Woo! Yikes. Oh my goodness. Wow. What did you hear? What did you see? Did you see the bubbles? Hmm. Bubbles are a common clue that scientists use to know when new matter is being made between one or more substances such as a liquid or a solid. After all, that gas doesn't just come out of nowhere, right? In this experiment, the gas is being made when the hydrogen peroxide combines with that powdery potassium oxide. Some of that matter gets put together and is released in the form of a new kind of gas, carbon dioxide. It also creates heat. I don't know if you can see, you certainly can't feel that heat from where you are virtually, but it creates a bunch of heat in what's known as an exothermic reaction. That's a big fancy science word for a chemical reaction when heat is being released. Now, as you can see, when we use eyedroppers, we can control how little or how much liquid we add at any one time. You might also notice that brown color, that brown color, is another form of matter that's being made. It's actually really being unlocked. That color is often seen in iodine, which is where potassium iodide gets its name from, the iodine that makes up that chemical compound. Now, none of the matter that we've shared with you is dangerous to mix, right? But you still want to go about your investigation with the same sort of curiosity and recording the note, the changes that you see or the fun phenomena that you might notice when you mix those materials together. Don't be afraid to just do the ones that we've listed. Just make sure that before you mix any substances together, you talk to a grown up first to make sure it's a okay and they know what you're doing. So, Miss P, any remaining words? Sure, Mr. Meslevin. <laughs> awesome. Now, there is another investigation in our slideshow that has to do with color in your eyedropper. And again, we'd love for you to share your investigations with us. You can email us at Pavlicek or Musserman 
at bpsk12.org. And we just want to have a, a final kind of parting message for you. Mm -hmm. We would like to wish you and your families a happy holidays. And Mr. Musselman, anything else that we should concentrate on maybe um, over vacation and just being you with should, the people that we love? You bet, Miss D. We should re be sure that we stay safe, just like Miss Pavlicek here is staying safe from my Woo! water splash. Woo! Right? You too should be staying safe from one another and the coronavirus by wearing your mask, whether inside or outside, even with family that you love, but may be in different homes. Stay safe, everyone. Have a great holiday. We'll see you in 2021. Happy New Year. Stay curious. Bye. Well, your hands are wet. Dang it. <laughs> Take care of your stuff. Take care of your stuff.